Kathy, my longtime friend, who I care for and love deeply. I'm not obsessed with straightening the chairs in the church, am I? Does it seem like an obsession to you? You see, in my long ministering with Kathy, she's probably seen me do that, what, one or two times or three? She's going like this for the people in our live stream audience. Yes. Many of you have probably seen me straightening the chairs in the church about this many times. Okay, I'm a little bit OCD about straightening the chairs, but I need to explain to you what I'm doing while I'm also straightening the chairs. You see, while I'm straightening the chairs, I'm saying a prayer for every person who's going to be sitting in that chair. So I go along and say a prayer at each chair, praying, Lord, whoever sits in this chair, bless them. Lord, let them feel your embrace. Lord, comfort them. Lord, strengthen them. It all depends on what the Holy Spirit brings into my mind, but it's, it's Lord, please bless whoever sits in this chair, but see what's even more special is as I'm blessing the chairs and praying for the people who are going to sit in the chairs, I'm asking, all right, Lord, which chair are you going to sit in at this Mass? Lord, where are you going to be present in this space during Mass? And the thing is, I did not come up with this idea on my own. I learned it from St. Therese of Lisieux. Everything she did was for the glory of God. They noticed in her the love with which she folded napkins, the love with which she set the silverware at the table. Everything that St. Therese of Lisieux brought glory to God, especially the little things. She wrote in the book, Story of a Soul, you know well enough that our Lord does not look so much at the greatness of our actions, nor even at their difficulty, but at the love with which we do them. The love with which we do them. God planned us for God's pleasure. And yet, so much of life sometimes doesn't see so, seem so pleasurable, does it? And yet, maybe it's because we need a sacred attitude adjustment that everything we do becomes a form of prayer, that everything we do brings glory to God, that everything that we do is worship. Because what I like is St. Teresa of Lisieux. She turned her life into worship, but when I use the word worship nowadays, I really have to kind of broaden its use because so often we're like, well, worship is when we go to church on Sunday and we sing. That's it. We're worshiping. We're singing. But that compartmentalizes your life. It's like, okay, I'm going to worship God at this time and this place only when we can make our whole life worship. I mean, I love how Rick Warren broadened the definition of worship in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, where he said, real worship is a lifestyle. Work can be turned into worship when we do everything for God. Worship is a response to God's love. And so in reality, why am I here? Because that's the question we're trying to answer during this preaching series. Why am I here? Well, a good answer is to worship. Our life can be worship. Our lifestyle can be worship. Everything that we do can be prayer. Everything that we do can bring glory to God. Even our work. Think about what your work life would be like if you turned it in to worship. And prayer, it would make Monday mornings not so difficult, wouldn't it? 
but everything. School, spending time with people who need a lot of prayers, even surfing the social media, turn it into a time of prayer. It really needs some prayer. We can turn everything into worship because why are we here worship? Why are we not here selfish and efficient? How did you like the audacity of James and John in this gospel? I mean, here they are talking to Jesus Christ. Here they are talking to their Lord and Savior. He had just laid out the plan for them of everything he was going to do and suffer and the glory that they were going to be able to share in. And this is what they have to say in the gospel in Mark chapter 10, verse 35, and then the 42 to 43. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Hello, are they two years old or what? I mean, help me out on this one, or maybe three or four or something, but it's like, gimme, 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 gimme. Which I'm not downplaying prayer. We're called to ask Jesus. But what are we called to ask Jesus? Frown, selfish ambition and glory? That's not bringing glory to God because Jesus makes it very clear. Jesus said, you know that recognized as rulers over the Gentiles, lorded over them, and their great ones make their authority over them felt, but it shall not be so among you. It doesn't bring glory to God to see people lording it over other people, does it? That's not what brings glory to God. That isn't worship. That's not why we are here. Just selfish ambition. Real worship is a lifestyle like was lived by St. Therese of Lisieux. She referred to it as the little way. The little way. That every little thing we do, even if we might think it's insignificant, like folding a napkin, you can do it for the glory of God. Setting the silverware, you can do for the glory of God. I mean, I want you to stop a moment and think about that. The next time you're at home and you're rearranging the kitchen table chairs, why don't you stop and say a prayer for who's going to be sitting in that chair? Turn the straightening of your own kitchen into worship, giving glory to God, making it a moment of prayer. The next time you're taking the silverware out of the dishwasher, make it a moment of prayer, thinking to yourself, you know, Lord, I pray that you come and dine with us, that you come, Lord, and share the table with us. Let us all celebrate how real worship is a lifestyle. Real worship is a lifestyle.